Welcome to our first official episode of the Practical Performance Podcast. And we're going to start off with a topic that's hopefully important for everybody, which is what is exercise economy? And we are primarily going to focus on this one on running economy. So this is specifically important for all marathoners and triathletes. We can touch a little bit on swim and cycling economy, but I think they deserve their own little segment as well. Um, And it's quite a big subject. So I feel like probably primarily focusing on running economy is the way to go. For sure. I mean, let's start off right at the beginning then. So what what is running economy? Okay. Running economy is the amount of oxygen that your body consumes at a particular submaximal intensity. So that's just thinking about the oxygen consumption side of things. It also can be expressed as energy cost and that energy cost then accommodates for substrate utilization. So whether you're using fats or carbohydrates. So you can think of economy really simply, the way I like to keep it really simple is just like your car. So a more economical car. So if you had two cars, you had um, a super economical car and a less economical car, you obviously fill them up. The more economical car off the same tank of fuel is going to go further, okay? So often athletes think, oh, improving economy is it important in longer distance stuff like Ironman and marathons. Absolutely, yes. But then it's also important to recognize too that the more economical you are off that same tank of fuel, you'll actually be able to go faster as well. Um, So that's the best way that you can think of economy. And it's one of the three factors that contributes to overall endurance performance. So you've got the athlete's VO2 max, you've got the athlete's lactate threshold, and then economy is your third factor. And that's not in that order of importance. They are all important. In fact, you could argue in athletes who are of the same level VO2 max and lactate threshold that economy is the determining factor when it comes to performance. So let's say, you know, like Joe at the moment is racing out for an Ironman or, you know, us when we're going for a running race, if we're lining up against all other athletes who've got the same VO2 max as us, which realistically, like Joe, at your level, when you're lining up against the other guys, you're all going to have the same or very similar VO2 max levels and probably very much the same lactate threshold as well. It's your economy of your movement that is going to get you across the line first above the others so when you're thinking about you know how do i beat my competition people that you know you always line up against more economical one that's where my money is going to go oh, it's a good sell isn't it, it definitely makes, <laughs> makes a good case for wanting to be wanting to be and, economical yes yeah, so well i think yeah it's lots of on like vo2 max and lactate threshold and they kind of forget about economy yeah lots of people think that a higher vo2 max means that you're going to go faster don't they but you would actually exactly. say from looking at it all that a high VO2 max is great as long as you're efficient and you have a good run economy because a high VO2 max but a very inefficient person isn't going to go as quick. And using your car uh, analogy, I guess that's the, set, that's the equivalent of someone having a massive engine in the car, isn't it, but very badly tuned. You know, it looks good on the surface, but it's not actually that good an engine. Exactly. And you know, like the prime example of this that a lot of research uses is Paula Radcliffe. So she had a very good VO2 max. Like there's no denying that. I think it was, uh, I can't remember if it was 70 or even 76 millimeters of oxygen consumed per kilogram of body weight per minute, which is huge, right? Huge. But she had that from a very early age because she was always a fantastic athlete. But when she changed to her marathon running and when she actually improved and when she got her world record, her VO2 max decreased and her economy increased. They, like when you're looking at uh, Andy Jones's work, who, who looked at, uh, you know, her physiology, it was actually showing that, yes, she decreased her VO2 max at the cost of being able to work on her economy to improve that. And that's what got her those marathon world records. And that's what separated her from the rest. It's not downplaying the importance of VO2 max values. Like I said, it's important to have that engine. But just like you said, Joe, if you then your economy is crap, you're never going to beat your competition. Like it, you're just not going to. <laughs> So, so, so would that have, that have decreased then? Because she would have obviously maybe done like a block of like VO2 max training. And then like, as it got closer to the marathon, when people say, oh, I'm going to do some marathon specific stuff, she would have done that, not done so much VO2 max training. So that kind of dropped that area a bit. But then the hope is that your economy goes up in that last 12 to 16 weeks enough that you offset the little drop in VO2 max that you have. And that was basically what we saw with her then. Was that yeah, what you'd say? exactly. 
and that, and that for her happened over time. I think that there, there was um, research to support that those changes in economy, like she changed that and improved that over 15 years. Like, you know. Oh, right. It's, it's an athlete yeah. for a long time. So you would definitely get bumps depending on what type of training that you do in shorter period. I'm not saying it takes 15 years, but yeah. that was over time her, her VO2 max dropped and her economy improved that much. And that was like the – the biggest room for improvement for her because your VO2 max values are going to plateau sooner or later. Like there's only so big an engine. There's only so much your cardiorespiratory system and, uh, you know, the, the adaptations that you can make to improve your VO2 max. But your economy, there's a lot of different factors that influence it. Genetics is obviously a huge part of it. Um, but there are also a lot of training factors that can influence it uh, as well that you can work on that do take a bit of time to have those and improvements. In one question for you do you think a good uh, someone with a really efficient or very good running economy will look necessarily better than someone who hasn't got a very good one or is it not just down to the looks because you know you see some people they look terrible when they run but Mm. can they still have a good run economy or will it be like something that you can see if someone has a good run economy like what do you think like that is a really good question i like that question so (laughs) There's a, a really good article by Barnes and Kilding in 2015, and it's a, sort of like um, if you wanted to learn about running economy, that's where you go to learn, right? And it uh, explains all of the factors that contribute towards it. And biomechanics and gait during running was investigated then, and it was found that there's not really particular things that are found in overall runners that contribute to improved economy of running. But interestingly, so that was in 2015, over the last few years, there has been research that's looked at particular things in the gait that do actually influence running economy in both males and females. So things such as more pelvic stability, decreased vertical oscillation. So meaning like if you're looking at a runner, if they're kind of like bobbing up and down, generally they're going to be less economical, which is not really a surprise because that is one indirect way to measure running economy. Um, Increased dorsiflexion. So like your toes pointing up when your foot lands is going to be less economical. Um, So having more plantar flex position, leg stiffness, like is going to influence that as well. So there are some factors that have been found recently so you could look at those in runners and have a look you know if you've got someone that's got a really dorsiflex foot and you know has more of a breaking uh force when they land they're probably going to be less economical but research also supports that in runners over time they will self-select their cadence and their biomechanics of running that will make them more economical so then your argument is would you see a runner and go, gosh, they look dreadful? Would you try and then give them these particular interventions to improve it, to improve their economy? Or will that just happen a little bit over time with them running more? That needs to be a little bit more investigated. And I think to answer that kind of question for you, Joe, I think that it really depends on the athlete because sometimes people just look like ugly runners, but they run really well. And it's their self-selected optimum. And if you went in to change it, you would definitely get an immediate decrease in running economy. But then once they adapt to that, you might see an increase in their running economy, but you might not as well. So, look, I don't know if that really answered it, but I think it's a real case-by-case one. Because I always remember the marathon runner. Do you remember Jep too? And her knees mm-hmm. would always fall in and her feet would flick out and you'd be like, oh, but she's so good. So it's kind That's of- what I mean, yeah. yeah. Some people look terrible, but they run so fast and you're thinking, is running economy something that you can actually see or is it that her body just that is the best for her and that's why her body's naturally running like that you know or is there actually she's already running really really fast but she could be even more incredible if she actually sorted out her technique I mean it's a you never know because I mean in the triathlon world you always hear people say about Lionel Sanders don't you they always mention him and say oh would he be a lot faster but is that actually really efficient for him I guess would you say the only way you'd really know if it is an efficient technique uh, technique would be if you put him in the lab took his oxygen uptake while he was running and then saw what kind of what his oxygen utilization is for given speeds that would be the only way you'd be able to tell I guess if it is efficient because you'd know what other world-class runners have at certain speeds and then you'd be able to compare it and be like oh it might not look pretty, but actually the science says that he has actually got a really efficient technique or actually you'd look at it and be like, oh no, we're actually losing a lot here. We need to actually put a big emphasis on making it look a bit more pretty and sorting out the technique because there's some massive gains to be had. 
Yeah, it would be so interesting, say, to do some economy testing on him. So the way that you do measure, the gold standard of measuring running economy is, yeah, to pop him on a treadmill. Generally, you do have to do it on a treadmill due to logistics. Pop him on a treadmill. More often than not, it's measured at 14 and 16K an hour because then that's what the research compares to. And then in higher level athletes, 18K an hour. Um, and then you do have numbers that you can directly compare to. But for him, it would be really interesting to also put him at his relative race pace and have a look at his economies, have a look at his Well, 16 pace. and 18 would probably be bang on for him mm. because 16K is now would be a 237 marathon and 18 would be like a uh, 320K pace. So pretty much his half Ironman pace. So that would actually be pretty much spot on, yeah. I reckon. Yeah, and, and but it would be really interesting for him, though, to do some form of pre-fatiguing protocol because one thing that really contributes to running economy is neuromuscular adaptations, increased leg stiffness. So that means, like, making your lower limb uh, muscles activate and deactivate at the right time. And research does show that in triathletes that is significantly lower than cyclists and runners who do those sports alone, even if the volume is controlled for. So what I mean by that, and let's just use Lionel for an example. Um, let's say if we compared Lionel's cycling economy and his running economy, being a triathlete, and let's say he was doing the same cycling and running volumes as just cyclists and just runners, his economy would maybe be less efficient um, than just the cyclists and just the runners alone because there's a decrease in um, neural adaptations that happens from interference from training for all three disciplines. And there is research to support that. Oh, really? So, yeah. So if we were going to test his, <laughs> if we, Lionel, come to Seychelles, I'd love to test you. Oh, wait, there, no, there's no metabolic cut. Yeah, I'll there's come to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll come to you. Um, like he would be better off for any triathlete if they wanted to test their running economy, do a pre-fatiguing protocol. And this is what I did in my PhD because we measured running economy uh, and the change that strength training had on improving running economy. But we did it after a swim and a bike because there's that fatigue there. So I also think maybe an athlete like Lionel probably doesn't look as pretty because he's fatigued, right? Um, yeah. Like most athletes, but maybe that is pretty for working that hard at that pace and it does work for him. I think if you tried to change it, you would definitely see a decrease in economy. I don't know if he would get that increase in enough time. I think it would take years for him to adapt to a new training, uh, to yeah. a new uh, gait. Yeah. That's, um, it's really interesting you saying, Kate, about the fact that maybe introducing a change in technique isn't necessarily going to elicit improvements mm. that you might expect. Mm. Um, that makes sense with experienced athletes, especially athletes um, that have been in the sport for a long time. What about maybe if you've got athletes who are more newcomers? Yeah. Is there more of a place potentially then for running drills and like more of an mm. emphasis and focus on running technique for athletes who are making their way into the sport? Yeah, this is a good question. Yes. So there was actually a study that looked at novice runners who were just sort of starting out. I think they were doing like anywhere between 10 to 30K of running a week. And they actually found that after 12 weeks, athletes made self-selected changes to their running gait. So their running gait did change, but they had actually just, it, it had just come from running more. Um, and I do think though, things like drills, a little bit of appropriate plyometric training, a little bit of strength training will help their bodies adapt to those changes. So I think the trouble sometimes people have when they change their running gait. So let's say, for example, we know from some of this latest research that having increased ankle dorsiflexion and less knee and hip extension is detrimental to running economy. Okay. So we go, all right. So ideally we actually want them to be a little bit more plantar flex when they land, which really means more midfoot landing, right. And to have more of a triple extension push off when they run and they push off. So you could give athletes some drills and some cues to do that, which I think is important. But if their body can't handle it, you're just either going to break them, you're going to give them an injury, or they're just going to be less economical because maybe their foot's more dorsiflex, they're doing more of a breaking force because they don't have muscle coactivation to help their lower leg stiffness to be able to help their Achilles tendon take the load to then push off, right? That's getting a little bit nerdy. But do you, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like they might not actually have these other factors, these neuromuscular factors that are important to be able to handle the drills and the change. So it's a big puzzle. And I think all of it's important. Drills are important. 
running more is important. Staying injury free is important. A little bit of strength is important. All in the right moderation. Joe, is, when, when you yourself have been training, how much thought do you ever give to running technique? Let's say now, for example, where you are now in your career versus mm-hmm. where you've been in the past. Like, has it been a factor that you've kind of considered at different stages? I don't really try and change it but when I'm trying to run and I'm trying to like in a, in a like say a session I do try and think about trying to be relaxed and like keep my head like looking forwards and not like bad technique and just think about like how how I'm running but I don't I haven't really tried to change it I more just try and think about relaxing and like where I'm hitting the ground with my foot and just making sure that like it's good similar to what I do in the water you know when I'm swimming like try and think about the catch and stuff like that so just little things but mainly just try not to like tie up if anything and like run with bad technique just trying to keep relaxed and trying to make sure that like I, I'm smooth if you know what I mean but yeah I, w- I don't really try and like I haven't never really tried to like change my technique or anything like like that I which mm-hmm. I don't know maybe uh if you if you were going to do it you'd want to do it at the start wouldn't you know or like a few a few years ago but I've never really thought uh about trying to change that but I think I'm quite efficient because I did some testing a long while ago when I was at Essex University and I think they said that it was like quite an efficient technique which is probably why like and I wasn't really doing triathlon back then it was just when we were doing like sports science and we would you know you would all like test each other at different like sports and stuff like that and doing different various different tests and uh, it was like fairly efficient so maybe that's why it's helped me in an Ironman and why I've had to have had some good runs off the bike because I'm pretty efficient, maybe at like 16 kilometers an hour, like you mentioned too previously. One thing, though, that I wanted to uh, bring up as well was also like recently we've seen the women's world record get absolutely smashed, like two minutes taken off. And obviously, like a lot of people have said online, you know, I'm not just the first person saying this, that, oh, she's doping. It can't be clean. It can't be clean. But let's just say, like, forget all that. Like, let's just say if she was clean, like, let's just assume she's she's clean and it was legit. What would you say, like, you know, could have helped lead to some of these performances if it, if it is, like, clean? So, like, assuming, like, innocent until proven guilty. Because, obviously, she's, like, beaten her 5K PB in the marathon, her 10K PB in the marathon, and was came within 10 seconds of her half marathon, which mm. doesn't look great on paper. But even if it wasn't, to get these improvements, so even if she was on drugs, that's still a hell of a time, isn't it, you know, for a female to run under 210? So yeah. would you say that like looking at that, she must, she has to be very efficient, doesn't she? Like her run yeah. economy must have been fantastic. She definitely. And there's, there's a lot of things on this one. So just quickly though, we, we were talking about this. Wouldn't you think like her friends would be in the crowd and be like, have you seen the Incredibles at the end when Dash is in that running race? And he's like off in front, the little kid incredible. And he's like speeding off and his parents are like, slow down, slow down. Like yeah. you're by too much. Like she could have done that and it would have been less questionable. Yeah. Oh, hang on, I can't get a 209. A 211 is a little more feasible. I'll go to that. Like, come on. No. Rumour so, has it her coach was seen in the crowd telling her to slow down, but she wasn't listening. Slow down. <laughs> I'm going to have some explaining to do. This looks way yeah. too good. Well, her manager's already like been associated with a lot of like cheese. The manager's now thinking, oh, fuck, I'm going to have some explaining to do after this. Exactly. Like you had one job, which was to not obliterate yeah. it, and you were not obliterated it. Um, <laughs> but so this is interesting because the let's take like the sub two hour thing as an example. So there was a paper um, Andy Jones and his colleagues that looked at like what's the women's equivalent to the sub two hour, and they predicted. And this paper was done a little while ago. They predicted that it would be a two fifteen that was already done by Paula Radcliffe because they were accommodating for a ten percent difference in performance between men and women. But when we look at the factors that contribute to overall marathon performance, you've got running economy, like we talked about, lactate threshold and VO2 max. Now, the lactate threshold is a percentage of velocity at VO2 max is very much the same in men and women. Running economy, very much the same in men and women. In fact, women are more fatigue resistant than men. So when it comes to marathons, long distance stuff, women are physiologically built better to resist fatigue. The only difference is VO2 max that would actually differentiate that overall performance because men are bigger, they got bigger muscles, mitochondria, like that different physiology is going to give them a bigger, bigger VO2 max, the amount of oxygen they can consume, right? 
So when you actually accommodate for that and then you accommodate for women have only been in marathon running recently. So you're going to see huge skyrockets in performance compared to men because men have been literally been allowed to race longer than women. Women were only allowed to start doing marathon running in I think it was like the 60s or the 70s and then they got like pulled off course. So you're going to see huge drastic increases. And I think that 215 that was predicted as like the equivalent of the sub two hour is, is that's out the window, right? Like that's not not the women's equivalent it's lower than that and so there have been other sports scientists that have looked at economy looked at vo2 max values and come up with some more times that are more likely as the equivalent to that and we know that the sub two hour is probably going to be broken predicted around 2030 2036 or something like that for the men's so the women's maybe earlier maybe you know who knows right but there are some that using proper equations are predicting the women's equivalents like a 211 um there's been one that has predicted it to be a 206 there are other scientists that say why can't women do a sub 10 um, about that one but my point is physiologically without cheating is it possible that she ran that time yes I think that it actually is possible. Are there valid reasons why she's just gone out and done that? People are saying it's the sho super shoes. Like, okay, but let's not be totally dumb. Like, super shoes are great, but can they... And she'd had them for years anyway. They weren't a change for this marathon. She's She's been using them for the last three, four years. So that's not a new thing, is it? Yeah, but, but, but best case scenario, super shoes give you a 4% improvement in economy really best case scenario i don't think she's an ultimate responder to super shoes four percent improvement in economy or well, a five percent improvement in economy can translate to about a 3.8 percent improvement in marathon time but like you said it's like she's had them for years but you could then argue a 3.8 percent improvement from paula radcliffe's time would give her close to ish like a 210 ish marathon so could she have feasibly done it Yes. Did she? Only she's going to know the answer. Like, I, 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 it's like Santa Claus. I, it's much more magical when you believe it's true. So let's just believe it's true. I guess what would be interesting, what we'd want to look at if we were to see properly whether or not we think it's legit is you'd want to see her training history in the build up to some of these other marathons and half she's done. Like, did she do them times with a really disrupted and terrible training block? And then it was almost like, oh, right, she had only run these times, but her training wasn't great going into it. And then also you'd want to see her biological passport or something, you know, yeah. while she's training, you know, if she's on the whereabouts it. program and see, yeah. is there a massive spike in something that obviously looks mega suspect? Because you could see, if you saw her biological passport and everything and she was getting tested really regularly, then you'd be like, well, that looks fairly legit. And then her training wasn't great going into the other races and she had a really good like five month, six month period into this one. So it actually does look legit, legit. But like you say, only the people close to her, her coaches and stuff like that will know unless she actually shared the details or come out and said something about it. I guess the big elephant in the room is the amount of Kenyan athletes that are failing tests, which obviously puts which makes people not believe everyone now, doesn't it? Because they've kind of yeah. brought it on themselves. Every time a Kenyan athlete does something incredible, yeah. because so many of them are failing tests, you've kind of taint everyone with the same brush, don't you? You know, and you just exactly. think, oh, and it's, they're, that, they're cheating. It's really sad for her if that's true, because like I said, physiologically possible, yes. If you, now I don't know her genetics, obviously, but uh, in these articles that look at like what's the women's equivalent to a sub two hour, they all talk about an East African being, uh, capable of doing that because of general the genetics looking at her body weight distribution she's got long slim like slim legs like her she carries her weight more in her her the top of her legs like there's everything about her that should be capable of doing it in terms of that like when we're talking about just looking at her just looking at her looking at where she's from looking at the physiology obviously I don't know her numbers but like she makes sense that she could but it does, it just overshadows everything that's been going on, just overshadows it. So like, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's so going on to, sorry, Nick, what were that. you going to say? I was going to say, if we bring it back to just thinking about, let's say the average athlete, and let's take marathon in this example, does it stand to reason that however economical any one person is, their economy can change during a race as long as a marathon, for example, and mm -hmm. this can apply to triathletes running off the bike as well. Mm -hmm. 
because at the start, we've all seen it. Everyone can run quite nicely, look like they're going well. But when you look towards the back end of a marathon and see what's happening, people's running gait changes, mm. doesn't it? And you can see that people are sometimes mm. less economical looking, like you were saying earlier, Joe, than they were at the start. So can one's economy change within the race? Yes, yeah, so it's interesting you say this because we did uh, a, a super shoe study um, where we had female athletes. We were comparing Nike and ASICs and we did it over a long duration. It was like two and a half hours accommodating for a change in economy. And, you know, we didn't change that much. But that's also because we had calculated their pace as a percentage of their lactate threshold and velocity of VO2 max and sat them on that pace. So we'd perfectly paced it for them to replicate a marathon pace. So it's that probably doesn't help because that's not what they go and do. Yes, you've taken on away day. one of the obstacles. We've controlled too, the um... controllables because <laughs> she did fade a smidge, an ever so slight smidge. But you look at the lady that came second, she was sort of staying with her a bit and then she ended up seven minutes behind her. So she proper faded. So her economy would have definitely gone in, in the crapper. Um, but definitely in triathlon, I remember from my PhD, we only did a 20 minute run off the bike and the sample of oxygen consumption on the second half of that was already less economical than the first no it was the other way around because they were getting used to running and then they had sort of got used to it within 10 minutes and then kind of gone downhill again but it, it will change over the duration um, of it and then also you're going to get less economical because your substrate utilization changes as well so that's going to influence it too so long story short yes it will change but it's not just about running mechanics i think we're focusing on that too much there's so many other things all right kate i'm sold on all this uh run economy then so how do I and others that are listening to this, how do we improve our run economy? What's, uh, what are the best things we can do to make ourselves more efficient? So modifiable factors, train more sensibly. So improving your cardiorespiratory system, training at heat and altitude will improve it. Um, and improving neuromuscular adaptation. So doing things such as strength training and plyometrics and working on that side of things can influence it hugely as well. And in terms of sort of bang for buck, obviously doing more of your endurance training sensibly is the way to go, um, including some strides uh, and some drills and technique cues, and then doing some appropriate strength and plyometrics, I think are the easiest things that all athletes can do because you want to think about what makes an economical runner well if you think about running you're running and you're hitting the ground you're taking six to eight times your body weight through one limb you're taking that energy you're storing it as elastic energy and then you're pushing back down again and you're pushing yourself forwards think yeah. of your lower limb like your achilles tendon your calf like uh, an elastic band if you make that really strong and stiff you hit the ground your tendons take that load they take that, expend it back again, push forwards, means that there's less metabolic cost because your tendons are doing the majority of the work. So if we focus on that, you can really improve your economy. In fact, there's studies that say that without having that muscular tendon stiffness, you will be 30 to 40% less economical. So when so we're talking if about you're, um, by a few percent, like 30 to 40% is huge. If you're... Um say like a, an athlete and you've got a coach and you're already doing like some strides for a bit of speed work before, you know, like in some of your easy runs or before you warm up for a hard session, you're doing like your actual training session. So you're ticking all the boxes of everything else like that. Uh, you can't necessarily go to an altitude camp um, or you can't live at altitude and do all the heat stuff. So you've basically got an hour a week where you can go into the gym or like potentially two hours a week because the only thing you're not doing at the moment is gym stuff and strength stuff. Mm -hmm. What are the best kind of exercises that someone should do if they're looking to go to the gym and say like what they think to themselves? Well, I'm doing everything else. I'm just not doing the strength stuff. What's the best things they could do if they've got half an hour to an hour or something like that in the gym? The best things that they can do is a combination of a little bit of heavy strength training and a little bit of plyometric training. And the best things to focus on is your calf and Achilles complex. So you'd go into the gym do some bent knee calf raises, um, a little bit of, I would say, like some single leg squats as well because they would really help with like the biomechanical side of it, like we are saying, so focusing on not letting the knee fall in. So do a couple of rounds of those to like warm up. 
pick one to two heavy lifts and you do need to go relatively heavy for those. And honestly, this is not me being biased because we're Valere, but if you were to Google how to improve running economy, if anyone went online now, and if you, if you in fact, if you pull up Google Scholar, uh, because then you get access to research articles and you Google to improve running economy, most things that's gonna come up, heavy strength training, plyometric training it will touch on all the other factors but it's going to be those so you want to pick like I would just pick like a back squat and like a heavy calf exercise and you would do those and then I would do something like some pogos to work on that tendon stiffness and that lower limb stiffness like what we were talking about so then you're getting in your little bit of motor control biomechanical work your heavy load and your plyometrics three components that are going to focus on running biomechanics lower limb tendon stiffness lower limb overall leg stiffness because that contributes hugely to improving your running economy um, and working on improving your overall maximal strength so then you can delay your onset of type 2 muscle fibers because using more of your type 1 muscle fibers is one of the biggest things that contributes to running economy so you improve your maximal strength you're going to help postpone using type 2 so you're focusing on everything in that boom in duh, duh, tick tick simple what about range of motion and mobility? Does that come into play for running economy specifically? Like if people feel like they've got certain areas of say like tightness or um, inflexibility, mm. is that going to impact their ability to become more economical? This is a really interesting one. So not necessarily, no. Um, sometimes being more flexible is actually inversely related to running economy now you need range because you need to have proper range through your hips your knees and your ankles to be able to have an efficient push off when you run because that's all that running is is getting isometric loading then eccentrically loading up taking the ground reaction force then concentrically quickly pushing off and going so you need range so your muscles can work through that to have those efficient movements so to some degree yes you need it to improve it but doing stretching is not going to improve your running economy and again anyone can look why does stretching good. make you feel good before a session because I've heard loads of people say this as well, that it doesn't improve your running economy and it's actually detrimental. But before I do a hard session, I like to do a few stretches. But why does that make me feel better? Or is that just pure placebo effect? Because I always feel like I'm running better after doing a few stretches. It, it can have a little bit of neural inhibition on your agonist antagonist muscles. So it can sort of like switch some on, switch some off, um, wake them up a little bit. It can help in that way but it can negatively influence acutely your running economy of that session. But when we're talking about stretching, it's passive stretching, that's not good. Active dynamic movements like a leg swing or doing some like lunges, you know, like these ones and whatever, like they're totally fine. They're not gonna be detrimental to your running economy. You want active dynamic movements. Static stretching is a no-no. So standing there and like just pulling your foot up and stretching your quad is definitely not gonna help your running economy. Yeah, and that's one of the ones that I do. Yeah. Oh, no. Are they really? I'm picturing yeah. it. Like, yeah. And like some like standing there and like stretching the, uh, you know, like touching your toes. Podcast on repeat is Joe. He was in it. I do a bit of both. I do a bit of both. Some sent me this meme the other day and it was this lady like going off at her students about something and she said, hey, look, it's real life footage of Kate talking to her students about how terrible stretching is. I'm not against static stretching. I'm not I'm going to send you a little video. I'm doing a run session after this, right? Today I'm not doing any static stretching and I'm going to take five seconds a kilometre off my average pace for the session because I didn't do any static stretching. My run economy has gone flying. It can have its time and its place. I have no issue with people static stretching. That's cool. That's okay. I only joke when I say, you know, I hate it. But doing it before an interval run session is not the time and place. The time I've done it for years before an interval run session, like literally like since I was younger. So, okay. If Joe, if Joe static stretches before his in run interval session, hits a, P, hits a PB, comes back and tells you, what, what what are you going to come back with? I would say he could have done his PB even faster if he didn't do that. <laughs> no, Joe, change it to dynamic movements instead of just. I do there. a bit of both. I normally do a yeah. bit of both. Well, there you go. That's what it'll be. Is the other bit. <laughs> Stuff. remove the static stuff just do your little dynamic leg swingies and what you want to do and some drills and they are going to get you your pv static stretch in your own time outside of that not before a session well on that joe's going to go smash his run 
remove his static stretching before his run. He's going to do it later and he's just got a dynamic run and he'll let everyone know how good it was. Uh, it's it's given us I think like a few things to think about when it comes to how to look at improving our own economy and the things we should be implementing within our training so hopefully if you've um, heard some things that you're not already incorporating within your training hopefully mm -hmm. we've kind of shone some light on a few things that could be areas for potential improvement yeah. for athletes out there and if you and... want any of those little exercise ideas jump on the Blaire uh, Instagram we've got lots of videos up there we've got them all on the app we've got PDFs for this kind of stuff but just don't do Joe's pre stretch no, <laughs> yeah I just want to say if you are looking for some exercises to do in the gym some strength sessions obviously download our app at the moment it's only available on apple but the android version is coming very soon we're like literally a couple of weeks away tops from it being released and the good thing about the app is it will coach you as you go there's run specific plans on there it tells you how many reps in reserve to do of certain exercises and with your feedback it will change the weights so it's absolutely awesome for improving your strength and conditioning and especially if you haven't got a strength and conditioning coach it's only 12 pounds a month and there's absolutely loads of sessions on there. Like, Kate, how many different sessions do you reckon there are on there across the board? Over 100, isn't there? Oh, like, it's... Oh, yeah. I looked on the admin panel the other day. I think we're up to like 2,000 different sessions. There you go. 2,000 different sessions, guys. So if you want to get into your strength and conditioning and you're not sure what to do, this is the best place for it. Like, there's nothing else out there designed for triathletes, by triathletes as well. Kate's got a PhD, so like it's all research-based, so... Yeah, you, there's nothing else like it out there and uh, you get a free trial for two weeks. So download it, give it a go. And if you really don't like it, then uh, you can sack it off after two weeks and it costs you nothing. But if you do like it, then carry it on. <laughs> Love it. Thanks, Joe. And also stay tuned to this podcast because we've got so many cool topics we're going to chat about. And uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll catch you next time. Later. Yeah, cheers. See ya.